So, hello, Kylie Chan, and thank you so much for sitting down and having this interview with us. To all our listeners and viewers, I would just like to briefly introduce Kylie Chan, um, author of the Dark Heavens trilogy, which we've been discussing in course. Um, Kylie Chan has a bachelor, I believe, in information technology, bachelor of business. That's right. That's right. Um, an MBA in information technology and an MPhil in creative writing. So that's a very that's exciting right. selection. <laughs> um, she has lived first for 10 years in Australia with her Chinese husband and then for 10 years in Hong Kong before coming back to Australia and starting to write, yes. thankfully for us. <laughs> On her website, she says that writing has been a big change in her career and a kind of midlife change, which I think can be a bit of a comfort for those of us who are already writing, but still looking for the big break. I, I certainly know it's a comfort for me because <laughs> we hear so much about all these early career writers that started the first novel at 17. So it's a, a good thing to hear that. Yeah, uh, yes. You can one of my best time. friends, one of my best friends wrote, uh, Isabel Carmody wrote her novel when she was 15 and was published at 21. Yes. She's one of my best friends and we have such different experiences. Yes. That's, <laughs> that's really exciting. <laughs> but it's, it's great to know that uh, you can write at any time. You can be 15, but you might as well be, you know, <laughs> whatever yes, age right. inspiration strikes. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, uh, so that, why don't we delve right into it? Um, my first question would be whether you would label your own writing specifically as Australian speculative fiction? Um, I like the idea of positioning myself within Australian speculative fiction because it is such a powerhouse of talent that to be called a membership of that club is just really wonderful to me uh, because there's so many fantastic Australian speculative fiction. Uh, we tend to be a little bit more um, creative, adventurous. Uh, we, we don't follow genre restrictions. So to be part of that club is wonderful and yes okay yeah i'm i'm australian i'm an australian citizen uh, i may have lived overseas but in the end i did come here and i made my main character australian and shared experiences across australia and asia so yes put me in that basket i am an australian spec pick author yeah <laughs> that's great we certainly noticed uh, the adventurousness that you mentioned um while while looking at different texts for our course so we're really spoiled for choice. Um, however, Australian speculative fiction seems to be, uh, at least in Germany, a little bit pushed to the sides. So we were wondering whether you could give us any recommendations. Um, Alan Baxter writes fantastic Australian-based horror. Mm. He's written a monster story about a massive kangaroo because big roos are terrifying. Uh, we're very good at horror here. We have Karen Warren, who also writes incredibly creepy horror. Um, let's move to sci-fi. We've got Marianne de Piers's fantastic reproductive sci-fi series. We're really, really strong on fantasy and particularly on fantasy written by women. Uh, that's Australia's big strength, I believe. Uh, just starting from uh, Sarah Douglas, one of the Aurealis Awards is named after Sarah Douglas. Um, uh, more recently, we have Juliet Morelia, who writes wonderful YA. Um, Leon Hearn, who writes her Japanese series. I could go on forever about the strength. I, I mean, you're the expert. But <laughs> the strength of the fantasy within um, Australian fiction is just wonderful. Yeah, and I, I mean, a wonderful... Uh, community we're all very supportive and everybody knows each other uh, we meet up at things like um, 
the conventions around the country and everybody knows each other. So there's a real community. It's lovely. That does sound lovely. That people have in, in information technology. Yes. <laughs> I, can, I can somewhat imagine that. Um, I'm glad that you mentioned the, the strength of especially Australian female authors of fantasy, because that's certainly something that we've noticed as well. And it, it's great. Um, do you think there's a specific reason for that or just? Yes, there is a very, do, 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 you, do you know the reason why? I don't no? actually. <laughs> uh, Stephanie Smith is the reason why. Have you heard of Stephanie? No, I no? haven't. No? Oh, yes, I get to talk about Stephanie Smith. Stephanie Smith took over HarperCollins Voyager back in the late 80s, early 90s. And she is responsible for the blossoming of fantasy and sci-fi in Australia uh, between like late 1980s, uh, right up until I was published in 2006. She published me. No one else would touch my books because they wouldn't fit into categories. No agent was interested. They didn't, you know, is it romance? Is it sci-fi? Is it fantasy? It's Asian. It doesn't fit in any boxes. And nobody was interested because it didn't fit into any existing boxes. But Stephanie saw the potential. She was at the time, this is like 90, uh, 2004, she was traveling the country, talent scouting, for excellent sci-fi and fantasy and she had she has an eye for it and everything that that Stephanie published went on to be successful so Stephanie Smith she's right now freelance editing in Tasmania <laughs> she retired from HarperCollins uh, resting on her laurels uh, but Stephanie Smith is the reason because she she didn't care whether you were a woman or a man, she just wanted great fantasy. She's really into epic fantasy. And I think that's why people like me who would have been otherwise ignored got our chance. She was the one giving us all chances. So that's the reason, Stephanie Smith. I hope you have a chance to talk to her because she is just so many degrees of wonderful. Oh, that, that sounds absolutely perfect. Thank you so much for telling us about her. I'll, I'll certainly try and get her to talk to me. <laughs> I'm um, sure she'd love to, yes. Oh, that, that I'll hear perfect. what she has to say, yes. <laughs> I'll oh, give you her email at the end of this, yes. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, so you said already a little bit about what sets Australian speculative fiction apart from other English-speaking yeah. One thing apparently being the wonderful Stephanie Smith. Yes. Uh, but are there any other things? Um, I think in America and the UK, a lot of the agencies are run by men. Mm -hmm. um, there is, uh, I'm sorry, there's a bit of a boys club. Uh, speculative fiction in the US and UK is a, something of a boys club. You have to be really exceptional to break in. Uh, I know that a lot of publishing houses are stuffed. This is my MBA talking. I'm looking at it from a corporate point of view and looking at the, the way the, it's structured and the politics happening here. So men are in charge of a lot of agencies. Men are at the top. Women are further down. What a surprising uh, situation that is. Um, but um, they... There is, I mean, there's research done that men automatically get a better reception when they present manuscripts. Whereas in Australia, uh, I think women tend to be at the top and they mm. don't have that bias. So we have a lot, it's, it's a very equal, actually, the, the community, the, the sci-fi and fantasy community, we have an equal number of men and women being published. I wonder if those, I wonder if the statistics agree with me. I'd have to look at, look at it. <laughs> well, to us, it, it almost looked like there were far more women than, than male writers, but I think we might have a bit of a confirmation bias. <laughs> that, course, that may be the case. Yes. Because of course, we also like to, to put female writers in our focus as well. 
especially oh thank you <laughs> but it's, it's really great that you brought that up because that is something that we've been asking ourselves since starting the work for this course so thank you so much um i've had trouble breaking into the overseas market i think this is one of the questions i'm looking at my questions over here <laughs> yes when you're gonna add yes uh uh, it's been rejection after rejection by mostly male agents and publishers. Mm -hmm. Yes, it, it has happened. Uh, my track record of being successful uh, is modified by, by the fact that I am Australian. Also, I have a weird surname. Um, so I don't know. I don't know what they're thinking. I just get a very, very polite rejection mm -hmm. letter. And I thought it would be easy to publish my new series overseas. Uh, when I kept the world rights and it's turned out to be almost Im it's practically impossible oh, to, okay. to get a publisher. Yeah. That's I'm not complaining. I self published is doing well. Yes. Yeah. But that's a, that's a, I think that's an interesting perspective on, on how the market works. And that's something that as literary scholars, we sometimes don't look at enough. So I think that that'll be very interesting for our students to think about. <laughs> My, my MPhil was about the business side of it because this is where I have the expertise and the IT and business side of it. I would like to push through doing a doctorate at looking at you know, the corporate aspect of publishing is something I'm particularly interested in. Yeah. That sounds very Maybe exciting. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make sure to read it then. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let's move on to the next question then uh, and get a little bit more into the content of fantasy, of your fantasies. Right. So when I was reading your Q and A's on your website, which were yes. really very interesting, one thing that I noticed was that you said never having to build a map yes. is an advantage of modern settings. Yes. <laughs> now, one of our sessions for our Australian speculative fiction course deals yes. specifically with maps. <laughs> yes. Um, so yeah, we had a, we just had a discussion about their users, their political implications. So I was just wondering, you might have included a map of Hong Kong because yes. I'm guessing lots of your readers haven't been there. I know that, that most of my students probably haven't. Um, so could you talk about uh, the choice that, that went into that and, and how you mapped the city verbally because I think you, you did that in, in some ways because there's oh, thank you. strong presence. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, I, yeah, I wrote it shortly after I, I, the city was very strong in, in my mind when I did it. Um, maps cost money and as a newly published author, I was um, on probation. Uh, so the publisher wanted to put a minimal amount of effort into the book to see what would happen. And once it was successful, I don't think the map was necessary. Um, there's, there's always maps available online, but uh, usually the author provides the map themselves. And I think at the time I was probably too lazy to do it, to actually trace <laughs> and provide a map of Hong Kong. Um, yeah, I didn't, we decided jointly that it wasn't really necessary to have a map of an existing place there. Looking back, it would be a nice addition, I think, to have a map of the locations that I use. But in the first book, there aren't as many locations as, I mean, this thing grew. It was like, it was like some sort of organism, the story that, that <laughs> grew it started off small and then and grew bigger that's that's pixie oh lovely name <laughs> <laughs> i'm very, very sure our students will like that <laughs> <laughs> there's another one here she's asleep yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, cats <laughs> <laughs> yeah so um I, I just said that you mapped the story with your with the the city with your words. So could oh, you? Oh, I know it so well. Yeah. Yeah. So could you talk about uh, how you how yeah. you did that and how you put it into the story so much? <laughs> um, when I was living in Hong Kong, I had my own little IT company. I was a consultant. I had a little car 
and I drove around to rich people's houses. Wow, some of these people were incredibly rich, just mind-bogglingly rich. It was, it was an incredible experience fixing rich people's computers. I was the only English language IT person who would come to your house and help you connect to the internet and help you navigate uh, Hong Kong Telecom's Byzantine connection method with the number of forms that you had to fill in and provide six different types of identification. I mean, the, the Hong Kong Telecom people, I'd call them up and they'd know me because I, I connected so many people to the internet. Uh, so I drove my little car around Hong Kong everywhere and I got to know because maps of Hong Kong are unique in that each building has a name. So it's not suburbs you get to know, it's actually buildings. So people can say, I live in Bamboo Grove and people will know exactly where you are. Uh, so each building has a name and the place is so small that everyone knows it building by building. Uh, so I, I learned where the good place to park were and I got myself around through the very unforgiving traffic system. Uh, and yeah, so I got to know the place extremely well and to share that, um, I did, I have to admit I whitewashed it a bit and then I made it a lot cleaner and less ugly in my books than it is in real life. Uh, because with the amount of diesel trucks going through there constantly with filthy uh, fuel, the, everything's black. Everything's black and moldy and everything smells really bad. And I didn't include that because I wanted to make it a romantic setting. <laughs> yes, so, yeah, um, it, we noticed. <laughs> it's, it's a place that imprints itself on your mind. And I, I, I'm even having a flashback now from the road up to the peak. There's a particular winding narrow road that you drive from the center of the city up uh, one Chai Gap, it's called, and then up onto the peak where all the rich people live. Uh, and the Peak Tower, which is a tourist center, I used to park in there to go and fix people's computers and their car parks underneath their buildings with visitors' car parks. And every building had two security guards at the ground floor level and they had to sign you in. And usually there were Gurkhas, uh, Nepalese left over from the British occupation. They, they got re-employed as security guards and just, yeah, I wanted to share the experience. And with, when you're a writer, you have a captive audience. So <laughs> I, I, yeah, um, when I was thinking of writing this, Harry Potter was incredibly successful and I thought I can do that. Uh, I've written so many technical manuals that I might write something fun for a change. And I thought, well, what do I have that Harry Potter doesn't? And I have that exotic mm. experience of a place that I know inside out. So yeah. it, it's in, in, I, I have the urge to go back all the time just to, just to be in the same places again, mm. revisit. Yeah. Some of my fun, fun I think class. that comes across really, really well. Um, especially, I think, Emma's experience with going to the, this rich area and seeing how John Chen lives and then finally realizing that's where she lives as well. That was really yes. interesting. <laughs> and I, I think, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I never lived anywhere like that. We we uh we're at the bottom of the market locals don't get that sort of money and my my husband was a local um so we tended to live in a different level of enclave and not that sort of wealth in fact um hong kong can be incredibly expensive uh and um sometimes it was just a struggle finding uh reasonably priced anything <laughs> uh, and we would come back to Australia to buy clothes and shoes because they'd be significantly cheaper than back in Hong Kong because no one wants to be seen wearing cheap clothes in Hong Kong. Whereas I'm okay with Kmart and I do 
actually do that a bit in the stories where she doesn't care yeah. and everyone else does. Yes, fashion is a big thing in Asia. I found that very relatable about her. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, speaking about her being relatable to me, um, <laughs> on your website you talk about writing for Western female audience. Yes. So I was just wondering how do you decide who to write for? Does this ever change and, and how does that impact your writing? This is going to sound awful, but when I started out writing, I um, I'd been in the IT industry for a few years, being a full-time mum in Australia. And it, I was looking at starting from the bottom again. Uh, I'd already moved three times in my life and had started the bottom again in IT, which is difficult. And I decided, <laughs> I decided I'm going to write a best-selling novel so I don't have to start from the bottom again. <laughs> um, and I'd done my MBA part-time while I was in Hong Kong. So I decided I would look at my novel as a product that I was going to sell. And uh, so what's the biggest market? I'm sorry, <laughs> the biggest market of, of uh, novels is actually women. Um, Romance, I tried. I tried to write romance. I think I tried to write romance with this. Um, it started out as a nanny god kind of uh, <laughs> hero romance. And then it took a hard left turn into politics um, because I couldn't control it very well. Uh, uh, romance uh, salespeople have said, yeah, your book's romance. It fits. Um, there's the, there's the great love that can never be and the big barriers and the, the great um, uh, acknowledgement and yeah happy ever after all of that um, so I looked at my book as a product and I did a lot of research about what people like to read and one of the biggest places I went to see what people like to read is fan fiction because people will write what they want to read Fan fiction is people inserting themselves into the story that they want. And there are a few threads that go through fan fiction. Ponies is a big one, so I put ponies in. Uh, love that can never be, sexual tension. All of those things are in fan fiction. So I'm like, yes, all right. Here's, I'm going to get these elements, put them together, put them in a Chinese uh, uh, environment. Uh, that is exotic so that it will be something novel for people and then I deliberately made the choice to make it easy to read and kept the language at the year nine level uh, so there's no great uh, literary devices in it there's no great um, the vocabulary the vocabulary is simple descriptions are simple uh, very visual the story is fast paced. So I wrote, I packaged up something that people would want to read in an exotic location that wasn't too difficult. Uh, and I did all of that deliberately and okay, yes, it worked. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly it did. <laughs> With Dragon Empire, um, Dragon em after the nine book Dark Heavens was finished, that was, uh, a very different place for me because I'd finished this masterwork and now I had to start again uh, and I just wanted to be away from all of that please no more yes finished um, I needed a break from it and so I decided to write something for me and I know once again I'm on Twitter and what do people love people love dragons um, and I discovered through my story that when I thought, wow, this is going a little bit too far, people would go, oh no, we love this. Take it further. People love me taking things way too far uh, and going places that, yes, a little bit train wreck type of thing. People would love seeing my characters do really weird stuff. So I'm like, <laughs> okay, let's go there. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, look, Anne McCaffrey's dragons are all very dragons on this side, people on that side. No, 
I'm going there. I'm going to fulfill everyone's dragon fantasies and put them in spaceships because it's fun. So we've got a, like a Doctor Who adventure going through the universe and dragons. That um, sounds perfect. <laughs> just had a lot of fun writing it. Uh, and it, this is a three book series. I've just finished the third one. Um, and I'm being yelled at by people going, you're going to leave it there. You can't leave it there. But I've kind of tied it all up, put a bow on it and said, right, that, that is finished. It's done. This is where we are. And people have started emailing me asking for more, which is the best thing in the world. I can imagine. <laughs> I mean, yes, as, as I said in, in, on my website, people always come up to me and ask me when the next one's coming out. Mm. Uh, and that is the most flattering thing in the world when people say when is the next one coming out and now they're asking me for more dragon ember i'm like no that's finished i'm going somewhere else now <laughs> uh and i i do tell them i've gone back to dark heavens and i'm writing a, a sequel to dark heavens and people get very excited about that so that's a good thing oh yeah i, I can absolutely imagine that <laughs> <laughs> Well, no. I thought I couldn't do it. I thought I couldn't. I, there's so many characters now. There's nearly a hundred <laughs> named characters in Dark Heavens. Uh, so much has happened. I thought, honestly, thought I couldn't do it. No one has ever. I'm, this is the where I was in my head. I was thinking, no one has ever done a major epic like like this a really huge story like that finished it and then gone on to have something a sequel story that has been even better received and then i realized no hold on it has been done so i'm going to dragon ball z the hell out of this story <laughs> <laughs> take it up Wonderful. another level <laughs> It has been done. It can be done. Yes, if Dragon Ball Z can do it, I can do it. All right. <laughs> Thanks for my project. Much. Dragon Ball Z the hell out of Dark Heaven. <laughs> it's very fitting, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I do reference Dragon Ball in the story, uh, mostly because it's all the Asian tropes. Um, they, none of the stuff I put in my books is unique or new it's been around forever mm -hmm. i mean it, the, the the throwing energy that sort of thing it's been around since there was scratching celluloid to make the effects on film yeah it's, it's i'm just i'm just sharing something that a lot of people haven't experienced but for me it was every night on the television yeah <laughs> I mean, that's, that's, I think, how writing works. You just take in everything that you consume and, and do something else with it. Um, yes. <laughs> Dragon Ball was actually one of the first anime that I ever watched when I was, I think, 10. So <laughs> I really like that you <laughs> referenced that. <laughs> Dragon Ball Z is so much better. <laughs> and at the same time, the narrative is so much weaker. Um. <laughs> That's an interesting I can, combination. I can look at it, yeah, as from a narrative point of view, as 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 a storyteller. Uh, but mm -hmm. it's hugely successful, and there are tricks that you, as an as a storyteller. I mean, it makes me a pain in the neck sitting next to me watching movies and things because uh, real you can't watch reality TV shows with me because I can pick the winner in the first five minutes. Um, yeah, I'm very cynical and I can see every uh, way that everything's being manipulated to forward the story. And sometimes I can see um, choices that have been made on the narrative to improve it that had to be made. And people go, why do they do that? And I'm like, well, from a, a you know structural point of view, it, I'm the worst to sit next to. No one wants to go with me to movies anymore. <laughs> I'm terrible. I, I dissect them afterwards. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's maybe Where a risk of the job. <laughs> <laughs> I, th I think maybe you should go with more literary scholars, then you can dissect it together. <laughs> <laughs> I do that with my friends.
hands. Yeah. <laughs> um, I went. I went to see Black Panther with a literary friend, and she didn't get it. Um, she didn't get the um, the reversal, the colonialism being reversed. She didn't understand that because she's lived in a very, very white space and mm -hmm. living in a very Chinese space and being accepted by a Chinese family. It's turned my view around and having non-white kids and having, having them deal with issues in an extremely white place like Australia. I mean, I go, I do do workshops about character buildings and I, I talk about white culture and I've had, had people get angry with me about white culture, you know, brunch, SUVs. Australian white culture is small dogs, SUVs, or large dogs, camping, um, boating, brunch, avocado toast, things like that, <coughs> that in the Chinese community you'd never experience and the Chinese community had its culture as well. So I can, I, yeah, I have the unique ability, uh, not the ability, but the experience to straddle both viewpoints and to see it from both sides, from my fam white family side and from my Chinese family side. And I could, they would share privately how they saw each other, which was extremely enlightening. Yes, <laughs> it was wonderful. Mm, that must have helped a lot with raising as well. <laughs> <laughs> before, before we move on to the next question, can I just ask a little follow up to, to sure. what you said? Uh, what kind of fan fiction did you look at for your market research? Uh, anime mostly because, um, going back to Dragon Ball, uh, anime tends to know its tropes, know the structure of story and know how to go way over the top. Uh, they're not just traditional publishing in the Western sense is, is quite leery about unusual relationships, poly relationships, LGBT relationships. This is only a new thing, whereas anime has been gender bending forever. And mm. uh, there's, there's kind of nods to gender bending all the time. And there's, um, uh, there's kind of uh, uh, look at um, The Untamed, that Netflix mm. yes. Wuxia series. There's a lot of um, uh, homoeroticism in there. It's, it's quite overt, but a lot of anime has it subverted as well. As there's an undercurrent because everyone loves it. Yeah, everyone loves their love stories. It doesn't matter what who who's loving each other. So anime throws that around a lot. They play with tropes. They like to break things. They like to subvert. Uh, gender expectations, whereas Western publishing tends to be a little bit straight down the line. Uh, fortunately, this has recently been yeah. subverted as well. People are subverting tropes, which is always fun. And if there's a trope, I will subvert it because that's what, that's what it's, it's fun about. So yeah, mm. there you go. I, I fully agree with that. <laughs> So I'm a big, big fan of, of anime so and manga. Yeah, fanfiction.net, I went through the anime fanfics because they would take something that's already a bit out there and then go way over the top. <laughs> yeah. And Mary Sue, I studied Mary Sue's. Uh, I researched what a Mary Sue is. I've been accused of Mary Suing myself. Yay, I win. Um, <laughs> because women write Mary Sue because that's what they want to read. So if, if it's got a strong Mary Sue current, current through it, yay, people are going to want to read it. That's deliberate, yes. Uh, I, haven't, I haven't gone full Mary Sue, uh, but that character is, is a bit like um, Twilight in that your reader can slip herself into that skin and be that awesome kick-ass heroine who isn't scared of anything. Mm -hmm. so, fan fiction helped me a lot. I think uh, we can move on to the next question. I think that relates right. a little bit to what we talked about before. Um, mainly, <laughs> I think some of these questions you've already answered now. Yeah. Like, yeah. About making excessive plans before writing. We know you did a lot yeah. of research now. 
Actually, I don't plan anything mm. except for book seven or something where I wrote a five line precy of where I was going to go and then I ignored it anyway. I am 100% a seat of the pants writer. Yay for pants. But what I do is I don't plot. Mm -hmm. I know where the story, if, if I don't have a clear ending in sight, where the big twist is going to happen. Uh, and I try to have a big twist at the end of all of my books, uh, except for book one, because that was a special case. But there's always a big drama or a twist at the end of every book. Um, and I, I wind up the characters and then point them in that direction and just follow where they go. And throughout my writing journey, every time I thought, wow, that was a hard left turn into places I wasn't expecting, I should pull it back onto track. Every time I've tried to do that, it's failed. And the story has come out much worse. I just have to trust that my brain knows where it's going. Yeah. So I don't plan. I just have an end in sight and then follow them. Mm. Uh, and they get there in the end, although it's usually a mad rush in the last six weeks before deadline. <laughs> I think lots of people can relate to that. <laughs> oh, no. I went to dinner with Stephanie Smith and it was after the Oriel, the Australian Science Fiction Awards, the Oriels Awards, and we all went to dinner together. There must have been 12 half a Voyager authors at the table and we all sat down and Stephanie stood up and she said, this is where you all tell me that your manuscripts are going to be two weeks late. And everyone went, how did you know? <laughs> So oh, right, yes. How did she know? And I said, it, actually, I said no about six weeks late. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm sure she wasn't uh, too annoyed at that either. <laughs> she, she didn't care. She cared more about quality mm. than anything else, which I think is what has made our community so great, so strong. Yep, that backbone. <laughs> <sighs> You start with the process right away. No, nope, stay straight into it. Half asleep. I'm, I'm writing down, yeah, what's happening that just comes to me. Mm -hmm. How do you decide who to write for? We've answered that. Does this ever change? Um, no. I think mostly I write for me. I'm answering the question mm -hmm. you haven't asked me yet. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> For the students um, or the listeners, uh, I think the question you're just answering is whether your audience has ever changed, right? That's where we yeah, are. Well, it's a very strange to go to a convention, a pop culture convention, not a science fiction business convention, but a, a, like a comic con yes. where I have a table and people come up and get their books signed. Um, and have to see the variety of people who love my books. Just, you know, um, some of them are a little bit too young for the content <laughs> in my books, but mum and dad seem to be okay with it. Um, ugh, that freaks me out a bit when an 11 year old boy <laughs> is coming to get book seven side. Um, okay. I mean, I'm, I mean, okay, he's learning about. Uh, uh, mature consenting relationships, I guess, and what a, what a, a, a healthy relationship looks like, even if it is between a turtle and a woman, or between a lion and a turtle, <laughs> between a tiger and multiple women. Um, yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, my oldest fan was in her 90s. Uh, I did a, a signing at a bookstore and the bookstore manager was in her mid twenties and she brought her grandma um, who was in her nineties. And she said, grandma's a massive fan of the white tiger. Um, can you sign the books for her? And she said, oh, I adore the white tiger. I love the way he has so many women and he's <laughs> such a sex fiend. I just love it. <laughs> <laughs> she sounds 
wonderful. I, she is wonderful, I yes. Her. So, yeah, I was expecting kind of a romance type audience, but uh, it seems that everybody who reads my book enjoys them. The best part is when someone who, uh, someone contacts me and says, I don't read. Uh, I haven't picked up a book since I finished high school because the books in high school were really difficult and boring mm -hmm. and I didn't relate to them. But someone gave me your books and I read them. Uh, that That is always wonderful to hear and I'm like, yes, I succeeded. I made it easy to read and got someone into it. Um, and librarians have told me that they, my books are labelled as high interest, low ability, and they give my books to struggling readers to encourage them to read. So success, yay! Yes. One. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. And, and, and yet you have two pages of further reading suggestions at the back of your first book. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> and every, uh, nobody really go. I've had people email me asking me for more detail about... I've had people email me telling I got it all wrong as well multiple people have emailed me telling me that i got every aspect of the cultural martial arts wrong surprisingly enough no chinese people have told me that it's all been americans cheers uh k-pop lover in texas mm. yeah okay <laughs> <laughs> there's always there's always a few um mm. but yeah people have done more research and, and contacted me and said, yes, you started my journey into a new spirituality. And I'm like, I didn't actually try and convert. I don't want to convert anybody to Taoism or Buddhism. That's not, that's not the goal here. This is, <laughs> this is not a track, a, 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 a track. This is just me sharing a culture and the belief system within that culture and how incredibly complicated the Chinese belief system is with three separate belief systems. I mean, Buddhism mm. believes in reincarnation and Taoism believes in heaven and the animist religion that everyone believes in believes in ghosts. So they have to consolidate all three of those beliefs with reincarnation, heaven and ghosts <laughs> after you die. And they do actually believe all those things happen at the same time. Yeah. It's wonderful. My father-in-law died, which was not wonderful. And I got to experience the full six weeks of a Taoist funeral rite, which was incredibly complicated uh, and horrible at the time. But yeah, an experience. Yeah. Well, which works of fiction have inspired you or still inspire you? Um, I don't. I don't think any really I just went off and did my own thing um I had read just about every oh well every epic fantasy on the shelves when I came back from Hong Kong and if I saw another mystic lake or mountain of doom or wizard's tower or elves and orcs uh and you know group of heroes on a quest with swords and shields i think i was yeah going to murder someone <laughs> i was so sick of the the western tolkien based golly there's so much epic fantasy that's just loosely or closely rate based on tolkien i mean so many elves out there uh in fact i went into the 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 Dark Heaven series determined not to have dragons. Uh, <laughs> they, they slid in anyway because it's part of Chinese culture. Yes. And uh, I wanted to have the god of martial arts. Um, and I discovered that he was a spirit of the north on further research. That was eye-opening. I didn't know any of this. I just wanted the god of martial arts and to share the Taoist belief system and have, you know, the romance going and all of that. And then I discovered that he was the spirit of the north and then the spirit of the east is a dragon. So, oh no, here we go. Um, and so I had to include those, those four elements, the feng shui directions. 
and it just grew from there and, and they kind of turned into real people, which was, I think, my insane brain, giving them personalities. Yes. <laughs> Thankfully. <laughs> I think it's, uh, well, since you just mentioned going against uh, all this Tolkienian tradition. Yes. It's interesting that, that John Chen is, is referred to as the Dark Lord occasionally yes. in the novels. That's oh, that's nice... just me fighting back against um, mm. Harry Potter's Dark Lord. Um, there, is, there is a lot of me kicking over the traces there in the first book with snakes aren't bad after all. Yes. Reptiles aren't bad, snakes aren't bad, snakes have a bad reputation. There's this immediate um, cliches, visual cliches in books. That anything to do with a snake is bad, mm. anything dark is bad. You mm. know, it's, I'm, I'm twi turning that around and uh, subverting the tropes. As, you know, um, handsome is good, e ugly is bad. Deformed is bad, crippled is crippled, or disabled is bad. Uh, all of the bad guys in my stories are very handsome. Mm -hmm. I think I went over the top a bit with the Demon King because a lot of people find him extremely attractive. Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> I have recently uh, completed a what's called a pitch deck. For a TV series to be presented to studios in Hollywood, this is not nearly as exciting as anyone thinks it is, because you predict, you put an enormous amount of work into these things and then you send them off into the void, <laughs> and then you never hear anything. But I included pictures of actors to give um, an idea of, of what we're talking about. And it was very, very hard for me to get it through that John Chen is not stereotypically gorgeous. Emma is scruffy. She's not Hollywood beautiful. Um, Leo was based on Michael Clark Duncan, who is not a good looking man. Uh, but the Demon King is extremely handsome Chinese man. Simon Wong is also very good looking. Um, the, the Shen servants are all good looking, but I've got my main characters looking very ordinary. Mm -hmm. And I had a lot of trouble passing that through the production representatives. They're like, you, you demon king, shouldn't he be the other guy? Because, you know, he's so <laughs> handsome, it shouldn't be the other. I'm like, no, that's the point. Yes. That's the point. The beautiful people are the bad ones. The other <laughs> people are the good ones. <laughs> Yeah, I, I really enjoyed your subversion of the tropes in that way. Thank um, you. <laughs> um, it, well, talking about subversion of, of tropes, do you ever think, well, you said at the beginning already that it's a bit of a mixture of genres, but um, did you think about uh, urban fantasy at all and, and following the, the tropes in, in some way or, or deliberately not following them? Uh, if if I see myself approaching a trope or a, approaching a character, when I'm creating a character, I think about the most stereotypical way that that character could be depicted. Mm -hmm. A good example of this is the head of the Celestial Library. Um, the head librarian, the archivist, right? Now, the stereotype there when you think of a librarian who's in charge of a celestial library, you immediately think of an elderly, slim gentleman, <laughs> old, grey, robes, dignified. So I'm like, yep, he's a 12-year-old loudmouth gamer who's a bit of an <laughs> asshole. So I, if I see a stereotype or a trope approaching me, I will immediately do my very best to reverse it. So most of my characters are what would the stereotypical person in that part be and then overturn it. Um, and if they surprise me, then they're going to surprise the reader as well because we just fall into stere stereotypes so easily that it is it can be a bit of a shock when you get to the archives and you run into this mouthy 12 year old and that sort of shock is it's fun yeah yeah 
absolutely. Uh, that, that's what makes your books so fun to read and also really good to discuss with students because that's, you know, subversion of tropes. That's what we love to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> I do a workshop on this. Uh, I give a workshop on building characters where I give them uh, careers, uh, pilot, policeman, librarian. <laughs> and I get them to do a stereotype on one page, side of the page and then turn it over and do the exact opposite. And when we come up with, with six foot tall, overweight, black, bisexual spies, women. Yes. Uh, yeah. That's when people start going, wow, this character is really interesting. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Is she, is she married? Is she religious? You know, does she have, is she in a poly relationship? How does she relate to her boss? So, yeah, that's when characters start getting really interesting. And that's when they start sounding more like real people, mm -hmm. which is which is funny because the, the, you think the stereotypes would, would be more common. But when we start kicking over the traces like that and making them very different from the stereotypes, people start becoming real, becoming mm -hmm. three-dimensional very effective workshop i really enjoy giving it because it, people have so much fun yeah <laughs> it sounds and really no great spies are the same ever <laughs> <laughs> there we go yep so i do it deliberately i deliberately subvert mm. tropes break stereotypes and i hate cliches yeah <laughs> yeah fun. yeah very very much fun to read um so <laughs> next question, you've already answered uh, by giving us some recommendations. So yes. I'll skip to the one after that. Um, oh, my favourites. Let me yes. talk about my favourites for a sure. minute. Uh, I didn't write them down. I know I'm hopeless for remembering things, but uh, Jim Butcher and Kevin Hearn and for the sort of thing that I write and Kim Harrison, uh, has managed to take vampires and make them interesting. Vampires are boring. Uh, <laughs> vampires, werewolves and zombies, I find, have been done to death and you have to be really <laughs> Literally? <creative>. Mm. Literally done. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Kim Harrison, um, uh, classics like Lois McMaster Bujold's uh, sci-fi series. I, I still love my sci-fi. Um, a lot of the, the sci-fi that I read growing up was very male centric. Mm -hmm. And I think my, I've, I've still got all my childhood books that I clutch with both hands. And there's a lot of Rogers Elasny and Isaac Asimov there. And I come back to it now and just realize how very male everything is and how women have such a small part in it. And so I've been, yeah, it's just been filling up the, the shelves with more women and reading mm. the books of my friends, which is always fun. And then reading books and loving them and meeting the people. Yeah, so yeah, Charles Strauss and John Scalzi and a lot of modern sci-fi and fantasy is going really interesting places. Mm. Right now I'm rereading Lois McMaster Bujol just as a comfort read. Um, <laughs> now that my all my work is currently finished yeah <laughs> yeah you so clever you know, some, and being being a writer destroys your your pleasure in reading you either have the reaction of why did this trash trash get published <laughs> or this is so good i am weeping tears of blood in jealousy <laughs> how can this so be so good like Lois McMaster Bujold is so smart and so incisive and just so good with the psychology. Oh my God, I love this stuff so much and I can't write it and it just breaks my heart. <laughs> so yeah, being being a writer ruins you forever. Can yeah. never enjoy anything again. <laughs> <laughs> and then sometimes you have those feelings and also characters in your head saying, you could do that. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean... More recently, um, a, uh, a newer writer in Australia, Kathleen Jennings, has started to emerge. She's a brilliant artist. She's a fabulous mm. artist. And now she's started to write truly, lyrically beautiful 
fiction. Oh my God, I cannot produce stuff like this. I can't draw like Kathleen. I can't write like Kathleen. Um, yeah, I, if I didn't love her so much, I would hate her forever. <laughs> but she's a good friend and just a lovely, lovely person. And so I can only look on in horror and go, damn lady, you're talented. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love her drawings. Um, her novel Fly Away is on my to-read list. Oh, it's it's heartrendingly good. I, I just had to get it because the protagonist has my name. Oh! That never, ever, ever happens. So, yeah, I had, absolutely had to get it. <laughs> yeah. Um, like, we've got, we've got new talent emerging all the time, like Amanda Bridgman's uh, coming out, Sam Hawke's coming out. Um, Devin Madsen did my character building workshop before she won the Aurealis for uh, We Ride the Storm and that one's just doing great. Um, I think mentoring from, uh, I, I'm putting myself in the older generation now who are inspired and encouraged by Stephanie. We're now inspiring and encouraging the next generation. That's Inari. Say hello, Inari. Hello. No. <laughs> so you've already mentioned a couple of references that pop up in, mm. in White Tiger, Dragon Ball. Yes. Uh, yes. And of course, the mythology that you're using. Mm. But are there any others that you deliberately, I don't know, referenced or? All of them. I, I'm, I'm an obsessive researcher. So uh, I research so much and only about 10% of it lands in the final book. I research for inspiration. Um, a lot of my writing friends go, oh yeah, I got stuck down the rabbit, you know, the research rabbit hole and didn't get any words out. But no, it's the other way around for me. If I'm mm -hmm. stuck for words, then I do a bit of research and that will take me in a new direction and give me impetus. So up on the shelves, oh, I feel junk. Uh, I've got all the Chinese classics there and a lot of, Chinese uh, philosophy and anecdotes and spirituality and folk tales that I have not referenced at all. Uh, <laughs> well, there's, there's still a future, future projects. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, there are so many gods that I haven't even mentioned. Uh, Chinese, Chinese Mappian is enormous and fluid and changes depending which district or country you're in. So Malaysia uh, will have different, uh, a different pantheon to Northern China. They will have mm. the same basic gods, but local ones will be different. Um, so yeah, I, they, if I put everything that I've researched in there, it would be a separate document. <laughs> For Dragon Empire, I researched uh, I I researched Yayao Yayaoi Japan, um, Yayoi Japan, uh, which is Iron Age Japan before written history, and there isn't much around surviving. Uh, we went to Japan. I went to the museums, and I but everyone's all up on samurai and the shoguns and yeah the the um the meiji restoration they're all about all about castles and samurai mm. and and all of that and this is way 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 before that before samurai existed uh because i wanted to include empress himiko into it and that was inspired by playing the first generation new tomb raider game uh, written by a brilliant comic book artist, Gail Simone. Uh, and I saw that, that the final final boss is Empress Himiko from the Yayaoi era, era. So I, I, I'm like, yes, I'm going there. Uh, and spent a lot of time researching Yayoi and there isn't very much left. And what is mm -hmm. left uh, is very different to the samurai era, the Japan that everyone is familiar with. So I had a lot of fun going in a different place there. And I did include at the end of Dragon Empire some of my research. What I wanted to research was everyday lives for people in Japan pre 
discovery, pre-Western connection, uh, because it was an extremely poor nation uh, without the money that, when the Westerners discovered Japan, a lot of money flooded in. Uh, and I wanted to see what everyday life was for, for ordinary people because I wanted to share that. And there wasn't anything. There's all lots of, you know, royal descriptions mm. and Western people going and spending time with the Shogun. There's a lot of descriptions of Shogun and Imperial courts and samurais and, and gay. Oh, my God, so much geisha stuff. <laughs> uh, but when it came to the everyday life of, of Mr. Eggman, Toting his egg. What did what did they eat? They didn't even eat rice. They eat millet and rice. Mm -hmm. um, so there was limited research material available, and I devoured it all. And then I put a reading list at the end of the third mm -hmm. book of the Dragon Empire series, just to share the the basis of this very very tough life that people are living. Yeah. So I, I do way too much research, but I don't think any of it is wasted. Mm, that I, I, can, I can totally see that. Do you ever have the feeling that when you do Google research, you, you just have to type in after that, don't worry, I'm an author. Please don't, don't uh, arrest me. <laughs> <laughs> no, one, no one has, no one has uh, accused me of getting it wrong from a research point of view. Mm. Everyone accuses me of getting it wrong from a cultural point of view. So I think even the most picky reader can see that I've done the research. Yes, definitely. Uh, it's just my attitude that people find uh, disturbing because it's not... Uh, respectful enough of Chinese culture uh, when uh, looking uh, on precedent like Journey to the West is a basically a comic book adventure with the Buddha popping in and out and flying around a bit. <laughs> so I'm using that as, as a basis where Chinese, the, their own mythology is kind of an adventure story. And mm -hmm. I'm just taking it up a notch and making it more modern. And mm -hmm. my Chinese readers know this and say, this is a lot like Journey to the West in that it's an adventure story with gods floating in and out occasionally. And a lot of the Chinese scriptures are like that. Journey to the North, the, the Dark Lord's own story, is a lot of fighting demons and going from place to place uh, and having arguments with the boss about who's in charge. <laughs> Uh, so, so from from the mythology point of view, no one's questioned that. It's just the cultural point of view. People are going that Taoism isn't actually like that. It's a little bit more Western. Western Buddhist tradition is a little bit different from Eastern Buddhist tradition. It's, mm -hmm. it's kind of been uh, folded over into Western culture. So people get a little bit uh, a bit of cognitive dissonance at the difference between Eastern and Western ways of of viewing buddhist theology mm -hmm. yeah and you also said that that most of these criticisms don't actually come from your chinese readers no <laughs> chinese people adore the fact that i've actually gone in and and i'm sharing the mythology uh, uh, they love the attention they love the fact that their stories are and also um one thing that's happened in China is during the Cultural Revolution in the mid 60s, religion was banned and temples were burned to the ground and all the effigies were knocked over. And religion, as Marx said, religion is the opiate of the masses and the Chinese Communist Party banned religion. And technically religion is still severely controlled and banned in China. And a lot of the people who escaped China to come to Hong Kong uh, had a basic knowledge of the religion but uh the all it's all been nearly wiped out and so i did the research a lot of people come up to me and said grandma talks about it but she, she's a bit scared that the government's going to come in and shoot her for talking <laughs> about it yeah and mom just wants to be modern and western and goes to church or just ignores it uh, so I've done the research and I've brought the gods into 
modern existence in a three-dimensional way. So a lot of times people come, come up to me and say, thank you for doing the research and telling me the story that I don't have to do it myself because grandma won't talk about it and mum thinks it's just old people's superstition. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Um, so that's, that's very gratifying to have so many people saying, yes, thank you for sharing our culture. We love, the, we love that it's getting some attention. Mm. The wonderful Wusha stories. Yeah, I can imagine that that, that must be very encouraging because as, as white writers, there's always a bit of a, a danger of, of, of being oh, yeah. culturally appropriative. And oh, if you yeah. get positive feedback, that, that must be, uh, I don't know, oh, that God, must be I was reassuring. I terrified when it was released. I was terrified when White Tiger was released that yes. I was be accused of appropriation. And it's the one thing that I've never been accused of is... <laughs> cultural appropriation because I think it fits firmly in the cultural appreciation mm -hmm. uh, box. I mm -hmm. like recently someone on Twitter said that they were collecting Asian fantasy, Asian fantasy writers for a group. And I said, I'm not Asian. I'm whitey, not whitest than <laughs> I am so white. Uh, I do have that kind of on the fence perception of having been in both cultures and very immersed in both cultures. Uh, so I'm, I'm intensely aware of the, the fact that I have to be specially respectful, but Chinese people are like, yeah, no, go for your life. We love it. It's great. Tell the stories. <laughs> You're the one who can tell them, right? So yeah, go for it. Mm. Uh, okay. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. It's something that I, uh as a writer, I think about quite a lot as well, because I think, I think writing about other cultures is a difficult, a difficult attempt, difficult, a challenge, but I think it shouldn't be forbidden because I think yeah. it's impossible. Um, if I read, uh, for example, I'm currently, <laughs> hello. <laughs> <laughs> Someone came up to me once and said, would you, he was Indian. He said, would you write the stories about the Indian gods? And I said, I'm not going to marry an Indian man just to write books. 